<laughs> okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. The Barcelona Bitcoin community is proud to announce today the beta launch of uh, BitSquare. BitSquare is a decentralized uh, exchange for Bitcoin and altcoins and is also in the future a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. So today with the community we want to talk about the, the exchange and then about the possibilities of this new autonomous organization to rule this kind of projects. Our speaker today is Manfred Carrer. Manfred is a hacker, a developer, a coder, and the founder of BitSquare. Thank you, Manfred, for being here today. Thank you. And I want to thank, of course, uh, FabLab for hosting us again. It's a great place. Thank you, Thomas. Short, short words. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Aleix and Manfred, for, for being here. Um, I think this is a mutual exchange. Uh, I think you're happy that to be here. We are really happy for that you are here as well. Uh, I said in the, in the first event we did together, we're really interested on building uh, in a practical cases and test uh, the Bitcoin and blockchains in real projects that we are developing in the Fab Lab. And we're starting probably something with uh, Guido and the BitHelp team. And, uh, and also with um, Michael, uh, which is one of the starters of the Bitcoin in Barcelona and yeah nothing to say just uh, welcome uh, we are open for more ideas to event related with the decentralized uh, society and decentralized economy uh, until the police knocks the door and we won't open so thank you thank you very much Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure for me to make uh, the start of a tour for a presentation, the project in Europe in 15 cities, all in all, uh, to make the start here in Barcelona, my favorite city, and here in FabLab, my favorite space for such an event. Thanks a lot, Thomas and the FabLab crew for the support for making it possible here. And I think uh, also this presentation will cover BitSquare, this decentralized exchange, and but it goes over. It's not only focused on Bitcoin and on, uh, on the idea of an exchange. It's more. It's uh, it covers also the, yeah, the ideas of decentralization and especially the concept of decentralized autonomous organizations, which are, in my opinion, and I think also in Thomas' opinions, uh, which is quite an interesting concept, uh, which has many. Uh, uh, applications, possible applications in the context of FabLab. But more on that later. I will start uh, with the <clears throat> to give a little bit of uh, background, uh, the motivation why I started on this project, then uh, show how to build a decentralized exchange, <clears throat> give a little bit of uh, overview about the concept and show how it looks like, and then we go to this uh, to this topic of the decentralized autonomous organization, which is a very important part of the project itself because it covers the organizational structure, and then at the end, of course, there is time for questions. I would like to start with a quote from Satoshi Nakamoto. <coughs> he is the founder, the anonymous founder of, Bit of Bitcoin. Uh, <coughs> What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each, with each other. <laughs> Sorry. And this part <coughs> to direct directly with, with each other, uh, that's really fundamental because before we could not send money <coughs> from one place to another without an intermediary, without a third party who is controlling and who is uh, holding the funds in between <coughs> banks usually and Bitcoin is the first invention which made it possible that you can send uh, tokens for value money <coughs> uh, globally to somebody else without anybody in between because it's a uh, pu purely decentralized system and that's really I think a milestone in the in mankind at the end I think it has something similar importance like the invention of the internet in my opinion and uh, this 
exchange of money works perfectly good in Bitcoin, but unfortunately we still don't have a solution when you want to enter this Bitcoin system. You need the centralized exchanges where you can buy the Bitcoins, where you can sell the Bitcoins. And these centralized exchanges are, are basically like that model. You have a middleman in between, somebody who is controlling your transaction, who is controlling your data, who is holding your funds. And in the past, we didn't have better solutions for this. So it was the common model for all kind of interaction. Uh, but today, with Bitcoin, we can do better. And this uh, middleman, this gatekeeper of the system, <coughs> is more problematic like it seems at the, at the beginning. <coughs> because it's not only <coughs> about um, the risk from security that somebody can hack the servers and then can steal the money, which happens all the time at the end in the Bitcoin space. Some people might remember Mt. Gox, that was uh, the most famous incident where a few hundred million dollars were stolen, got stolen. And <coughs> but it's much more because uh, much more important is the fact that they are holding the user's data and they have the ability to connect this uh, <coughs> this data which are identifying your uh, yeah your your uh, identity <coughs> with uh, and matching this identity with your bitcoin address and <coughs> in combination with the transparent nature of the blockchain of Bitcoin's uh, data structure in Bitcoin uh, when you don't know the <coughs> sorry <coughs> The way how the data are stored is a decentralized data base in a way, it's called blockchain. <coughs> and this blockchain is completely public. You can imagine like a bank has its uh, data database completely public to everybody. Of course you would be very scared that your neighbor can see all your financial transactions. So that would be a problem. But you have, uh, normally the bank is just in possession of the state and nobody else, so it's somehow acceptable. In Bitcoin, everybody can access and can see and can read this data. And uh, it works for Bitcoin because the addresses, like in the bank, your bank account in Bitcoin, are pseudonymous. That means that uh, as long as you are not exposing that this address is your address, nobody knows it. And with that, you have quite a high level of anonymity but it's a little bit a complex system because as soon as you are losing this anonymity as soon as somebody knows okay that's m that's the address of this person then they can follow all the other address uh, uh, transactions because it's a system a, a chain of transactions where you receive the money and where you spend it and with clever analysis with uh, graph analysis you can uh, yeah you can get quite a, uh, a big uh, picture of the trans uh, of the financial transactions and that's not only a privacy concern that's also a concern for perfectly legal uh, use cases like companies don't want to expose their financial uh, transactions to their competitors or to other companies they want to keep uh, yeah, that, uh, their financial interactions private that's completely uh, normal for everybody that uh, we don't want that every, the whole world knows how we are spending and where we are spending the money so this centralized exchanges are on this border to get into the Bitcoin space. They are these gatekeepers. And as these gatekeepers, they have the ability to match your real life identity because you need, uh, yeah, you need to make your identification uh, when you want to get an account there. And then they know which Bitcoin you have purchased there and uh, how you have used this Bitcoin at the end. So that's very critical aspect. Of course, there are possibilities where you can get back uh, yeah, some anonymity when you take care, but it's difficult and it's complex. <coughs> and yeah, and this stuff happening. So there were recently, when you're in the Bitcoin uh, space, you have maybe read about this uh, anchor chain uh, where a research group in the MIT is working on a system where they can basically create a yeah, version where everybody needs to register to use Bitcoin and the miners can only mine Bitcoins uh, which come from registered users. And that would be the opposite of for what was Bitcoin created for. That 
that would be a dystopian version of Bitcoin. And there are quite a lot of companies who are working on chain analysis and there are exchanges who are closing accounts because they find out that uh, maybe your Bitcoin have been used in the past, not from you directly, but when they go back in history, they find that was used in maybe in one shop where you can buy marijuana or whatever, and then they close the accounts. And that's a very dangerous development in my opinion. And even those companies who are not doing this actively, they have the ability and the data are there and the governments can just pick up this data and that's a very uh, critical point. Sorry. <laughs> and it's not only about this privacy aspect, as I said, um, and additionally, additionally, it's also attacking a very fundamental property of money, of each money, of our fiat money as well, and that's the property of fungibility. Fungibility means that every unit of a money, uh, yeah, of money, every coin, every dollar note has exactly the same value and is interchangeable with any other unit of this money, and that's very important because when that would not be true, then you would need to <coughs> check and verify every every dollar note, every euro, uh, what you get, and that would be so much effort and so risky that you would uh, reject to accept it, and society would fall back to barter. And that was a case as in the 17th century, the courts in Scotland have already decided in favor of fungibility and uh, decided in a case where money got stolen and then they found out the thief and they would have had the possibility to come confiscate this money. But the church has decided, no, the utility of money for society has a higher value than this particular criminal act. And when we start that it's possible that uh, money get confiscated because, uh, yeah, maybe after a while they find out this money was used or was stolen somewhere, then people would not use money anymore. And as you might know, every dollar note would fail with something as well because every dollar note or nearly every dollar note has traces of cocaine on it. So when you would apply these rules to the current money, you, m uh, yeah, you must not accept the dollar note because it might have been uh, in the history in an illegal activity and maybe someday uh, the bank where you want to get rid of this dollar note will, ex will not accept it and it's basically destroyed money. So this concept of fungibility is very central and essential for any type of money and with this connection that um, exchanges have the possibility to attach history of a coin to your identity and to your coins uh, they are attacking this uh, they are actually destroying uh, this property and that would destroy Bitcoin as currency that would create uh, that would uh, change Bitcoin in the worst currency the dollar would be better currency like Bitcoin if that would happen and I think that's <coughs> Yeah, that's the reason why, I, in my opinion, uh, <coughs> these elements are even more important like the security uh, reasons. That's very obvious, of course, when you run a centralized exchange and somebody hacks the servers and steals the money, that's a big risk. And when there is a possibility to avoid this, we should go in these directions. And, <coughs> yeah. So what's the solution? How you can avoid <coughs> that a server, yeah, that a uh, third party is holding the money and that uh, you're following these problematic uh, patterns? Uh, decentralize everything. That's of course easier said as done, <coughs> but luckily it's possible. And there are quite a few uh, projects <coughs> who have um, who have proven that this is possible. Most famously, uh, BitTorrent and Bitcoin itself, and BitSquare is trying to follow the same path. So we think that uh, you can, with the new technology which has been invented in the last 20 years, we have new possibility, we can solve problems which was not possible to solve in another way in the past, like with trusted third parties. We can solve this in a different, more efficient and more secure way. 
So how, did, how is this done in BitSquare? What is BitSquare? BitSquare is a desktop application. You simply download it from our web page, install it as a one-click installer, and run it. It's for all basic, uh, yeah, for all major operating system systems, uh, Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux, and nothing special required. <coughs> it operates uh, over Tor, as it uses a custom peer-to-peer -peer network, <coughs> and uses Tor hidden services. But no worry, you don't need to install anything or set up anything. It's all integrated in BitSquare, so you don't really see anything from Tor. You just get this uh, very high level of privacy and, and security from the Tor network. And <coughs> For yeah, for ensuring a safe trade, it uses a trading protocol, where, uh, which we will see in a moment. Uh, there is no registration required, so you, <clears throat> when you download, you can immediately start trading. You just uh, do the basic setup in your application, but you need, don't need to wait for verification of your identity or whatever. And it's completely open source. Uh, it uses GPL license and BitSquare. <coughs> as it's important that uh, this decentralization aspect does not stop uh, on the organizational uh, layer. So it's applied, of course, to the infrastructure, like the peer-to-peer -peer network and the way how the protocol is designed. But it also uh, uh, we also applied it to the organizational structure. So BitSquare is not a startup. It's not a company. It's not funded by venture capital. It's a community project. It's open source and everybody can participate and it uses this concept of decentralized autonomous organization about, uh, yeah, we will talk about this later. <coughs> yeah, how is the security ensured in such a system? Maybe we we uh, we imagine a little bit how you could build when you have a peer-to-peer -peer system. How you could build an exchange. <coughs> the first naive approach would be that you just send uh, the Bitcoin to the other trader and then wait that he send you the, the fiat money. But of course, <coughs> when he does not send you the fiat money, yeah, then you are you are scammed, and that would be uh, would happen very soon probably. So that's not working for sure. <coughs> then the next approach would be yeah, to use somebody. Who are uh, yeah? Who both uh, traders are trusting? So you find an escrow. So you put your Bitcoin to the escrow. The other trader sent the fiat money to the escrow, and when the escrow has both, so he knows both have uh, a fair. Then the escrow sent the money um, to the yeah, to the to the traders and the fiat to the other trader. But of course, that's exactly the model what the centralized exchanges <coughs> are using, and with all the prob uh, problems what we've seen before. Luckily, uh, Bitcoin <coughs> has uh, a, a solution to replace this escrow, this third party, and that's uh, this concept of multisig. For the people who never heard about this, <coughs> uh, it's basically like a lockbox. Uh, you have multiple inputs, so people can put different people can put in the money in, <coughs> and to uh, get out the money again from this lockbox, you need a certain amount of keys, and that can be defined two or three or three or four or whatever. We use a two of three multisig. That means you have uh, three keys all in all, and you me you need minimum two keys to unlock unlock this multisig or this lockbox. And the the key holders in our case are the two traders and an arbitrator. So when the two traders are starting and they're locking up the Bitcoin, then this Bitcoin get locked in this lockbox instead of an escrow, of, instead of a third party. And uh, at the end, when everything goes fine and you want to unlock it, both traders uh, doing the unlock of the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin buyer will receive his money. That would basically add a solution for that, but you have a few problems. The first problem is yeah, what happens, the Bitcoin seller has locked his money there, but what happens when the buyer never sent the fiat money? So you need to uh, need an incentive that he follows the defined protocol, and we use a security deposit for this. 
purchase. So when the buyer who has nothing to lose at the beginning, because only the seller has locked up his money, when he is not following the protocol, he will lose his security deposit. It's a little bit like when you're buying a house and you go to the notary and the seller or the buyer of the house maybe need to deposit a lot of money for the house and the seller maybe change his opinion a week later and the buyer has all the problems to get the money from the bank and a lot of effort and the buyer has nothing to lose. In real life, I think I never uh, have bought a house and don't know how it works in reality, but I imagine that the notary who is doing this will also take some money from both parties so when the buyer changes his mind he will lose quite a lot of money as an incentive that he is following the protocol like it was defined. And the third element is this decentralized arbitration system. As we <coughs> have heard, this multisig, uh, there is a third, uh, yeah, the third uh, key holder is this arbitrator. And uh, the arbitrator only comes into place when there is a problem, when uh, the, one of the traders are violating the, um, yeah, the process the protocol. So for instance, when one is buying Bitcoin and the other is selling Bitcoin, and uh, the, when in the protocol uh, the Bitcoin buyer need to send the fiat money to the other trader and he does not start and does not do this, then the seller has the chance to call the arbitrator and the arbitrator will investigate. He's like a judge more or less. He will check the case. He will try to find out what was going wrong and then will make the payout to the, to the honest trader and uh, the one who has violated the rule will lose his security deposit. Let's go a little bit uh, more in the details of this concept. <coughs> As we, uh, when you want to read more about the details, you can go on our webpage. To, uh, there is a white paper where it's everything explained, but here we have just a very high level overview. And <coughs> here we have on the left side uh, the Bitcoin buyer. We call her Alice in this case. <coughs> and on the right side, Bob, who wants to sell Bitcoin. And yeah, uh, it starts that Alice, for instance, she creates an offer. She publishes this offer that she wants to buy one Bitcoin for $500 to this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. Uh, every other user in the network receives this offer and it gets displayed in an offer book. So everybody can browse this offer and can decide if they want to take this offer from Alice. Uh, Bob on the other side, yeah, he received this offer and says, okay, I will take this offer. And then the trade starts. At this moment, uh, both are paying in their security deposit, the 0 0.01 Bitcoin here in this case. Uh, that's all actually used in BitSquare at the moment. And uh, the, the amount what Bob is selling, one Bitcoin, uh, get locked up in this multisig. So at this moment when the trade starts, when Bob is taking the offer, uh, we are both uh, the client, the software of both uh, clients, uh, create this multisig transaction and uh, the money of both trades, uh, traders get locked up in this multisig and is then not accessible for anybody uh, just when both are uh, agreeing to uh, sign a payout transaction then it gets accessible again and this yeah the next step will be that Alice need to wait for at least one Bitcoin transformation because on the Bitcoin network you need to wait uh, more or less 10 minutes for such a confirmation to be sure that the other the other uh, sender of the money has not made a double spend or whatever so that it's really in the, in the database stored. That's just a minimum security requirement um, and of course adds a little bit of uh, time loss but as we when you use uh, fiat money with banks you losing probably much more time with the banks. And then the next step will be that Alice need to transfer her, uh, yeah, the, this $500 in this case, to the bank uh, account from Bob. And that's happening outside of Bit, uh, BitSquare. <coughs> so she goes to her banking webpage, uh, she gets over BitSquare all the information what she needs, so the name and the bank account from Bob, and um, then she entered the data in the banking webpage, sent the money to Bob, and then she go, she go back to BitSquare and and confirmed that she has started uh, to transfer the money. <coughs> yeah, after she has confirmed, 
Bob receives this uh, information <coughs> and then he has to check on his bank account uh, if he has received the money. That can be instant when you have luck and you re uh, use uh, modern payment processes like Okabe or Perfect Money <coughs> or when it's the same banks in some countries it's also quite fast or nearly instant. When uh, yeah, with SEPA in different countries it's usually one to three days. I don't know why the banks use so long. Maybe they send the money by doves or whatever. I don't know. It's really not explainable why they need three days to send money from A to B, but it's still the case, unfortunately. And when Bob has received this money, then he's basically happy because he has sold one Bitcoin and has received 500 euro, uh, dollar. And then he will uh, confirm as well. And with this confirmation, <coughs> the payout transaction gets created also by the software. And <coughs> this multisig get, lock, uh, get unlocked by the signatures of both traders, so both have this key to the ability to unlock the multisig and then Alice will get this one Bitcoin, the trade amount, and both get back this 0 0.01 Bitcoin which was the security deposit. That's uh, yeah, that's basically the way how the concept works, how you can build a system which does not need a third party which is in control of the money. Because in this case, the money is always uh, in, the u in control of the users. When it's locked up in the multisig, it's not in another place. It's just that you need two keys or two or three keys to unlock it again. And the two keys are basically normally the two traders. It's a kind of like a contract. It's uh, it's a smart contract, it's called. Um, and those are basically like, like legal contracts which are able to be executed in the blockchain uh, with computer code with, uh, and not with, the, with our legal system. So both creating this contract, yeah, I want to sell you this, um, f uh, I want to buy one Bitcoin from you, for, uh, uh, from you with 500 euro and uh, we are locking up this and when uh, the seller has received the money, he agrees that he will unlock it as well with the, with the buyer. Of course, the buyer is always interested to get this money out and then um, yeah this um, contract get executed and the money has uh, moved from Bob to Alice without being any uh, ever in possession of a third party and of course and of course that's not only theory it's implemented in software. <coughs> Here are a few screenshots uh, how it looks like. <coughs> It's basically what you would expect from an exchange software. You see the market, an overview of the market and the activities. You see this offer book, uh, where you see all the offers which are available, what you just can then click, buy or sell Bitcoin, and you can create new offers and can define the price and the amount and the percentage from the market uh, price, if you want to have it more dynamic and flexible. I planned initially to make a software demo here, but I think it would be a little bit too long and too complicated, so I think it's better to keep a little bit more time for the questions at the end and just leave it with the screenshots. You can try it out and install it uh, from our web page. It's quite easy to use and uh, yeah, then you see it, how it works. <coughs> yeah. And as I said in <coughs> initially, uh, we will bring all this stuff also in the context of FabLab. And that's this decentralized autonomous organizations. <coughs> uh, yeah, they call it DAO or DAO. <coughs> uh, what is this? It's a, <coughs> it's a form of organization where you are uh, executing the rules, not by contracts, by legal contracts, but by code and software. <coughs> And that's uh, yeah. And you use you use usually a blockchain or blockchain technology like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. And you use also usually a peer-to-peer -peer network or peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. So you get this decentralized an organization. But the autonomous is a little bit harder to to grab what it really means about, because uh, it means that it you create an organization which will somehow live by its own, and of course that sounds a little bit like science fiction. But at the end it's not. We will see later that uh, it's already existing in some form. Uh, <coughs> what's needed for that? Also, you have usually kind like shareholders or participants who are, yeah, who are the stakeholders of this organization. And um, 
to, yeah, to get this human involvement because the complicated parts you cannot normally you cannot uh, <coughs> execute over code and software. You can do the easy parts there and that's great <coughs> what we can do already but uh, difficult tasks like for instance hiring developers for building such a software you cannot yeah, there are no AIs w uh, which you can program which are hiring other AIs for building a software that's still very very, very fast science fiction in my opinion. And so you have to create uh, incentives that, uh, that um, yeah, that the organization create these incentives that people come by itself and working on the, on the project and improving the project and doing this task which are needed, uh, which cannot be fulfilled by software. In the exchange, in the exchange uh, example, <coughs> this security deposit is such a kind of incentive. Because without the security deposit, we have seen there are difficult problems. You cannot solve this by code. So you set up the security deposit and with that, the traders have a monetary incentive to follow the protocol correctly and do all this work like going to the bank account and making the transfer and checking the bank account because they don't want to lose the security deposit. And in the context of uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, it's usually more used, yeah, it's usually you have a, a kind of a revenue uh, source, <coughs> some monetary, usually some monetary value, but I think it don't need to be limited to monetary value. It can be any value, representation of value, uh, <coughs> yeah, what you can imagine. That can be representation for repu reputation or for social value as well. But you need some something what you can give to the people who are participating and who are, who are uh, fixing this problem of the human interface where you have to solve complex, difficult problems where you need a lot of creativity and uh, yeah, stuff what computer Computers cannot do, and uh, that these people get uh, attracted to do this work. <coughs> that sounds all very abstract, but when you look at Bitcoin and when you look a little bit uh, about the history in Bitcoin, how it started, <coughs> you see that it's actually a DAO. Uh, in the early adopters of Bitcoin, the early developers or people who have contributed to the infrastructure or in promotion, <coughs> they probably, when they weren't completely stupid, have uh, purchased a lot of Bitcoin in these early days and they are now quite rich with this Bitcoin because of the price increase. Th this system, what they have uh, all together built, uh, had created much more value over time and <coughs> they had their stake in this in this organization with their early contribution and so on and get paid at the end with uh, this value increase of the tokens. So you have already a system where there is no CEO and no boss and no company who is paying the developers where you have just a monetary uh, unit as a Bitcoin, a token and when this token which is representing the value of the overall project when this token raise in price, in, in value, when other people think, yeah, that's really Im important and cool and great and we want to use this as well, then yeah, more people want it and then it uh, resources get uh, <coughs> gets scarce and uh, the value rise. And then these people earn money with this. And I think that's a quite interesting and clever uh, strategy how to solve these problems that um, that you get uh, humans, human workers, <coughs> who are not only working by motivation of altruism for a project, because that does not scale so well, but who are really actually earning money. And I think in the context of FabLab, one second. <coughs> I think in the context of FabLab, uh, there are quite a few interesting application, possible applications for that. <coughs> Imagine a system where you want to deploy IoT devices and you want to have mass deployment because maybe there are sensors and <coughs> it doesn't make sense when you just get from a few geeks who has installed the sensors, a few, uh, uh, 20 or uh, 50 data, you need 10,000 or whatever. And to deploy this device, even if it's cheap, that 10,000 people in Barcelona are installing this device to measure air quality, for instance, that's uh, quite a challenge. It's uh, e even either it takes a lot of money or needs support from the government or whatever. People usually don't invest time and energy and money to helping you with that. <coughs> 
you don't find so many altruistic people, unfortunately. Maybe in Barcelona, but not in other cities. And uh, to, yeah, to solve this problem, you could use a token which represents uh, the value of the overall project, which is at the, begin, at the beginning zero, because yeah, when it starts, usually the project has no value. <coughs> but uh, everybody who is participating, who is installing, for instance, this device, becomes a shareholder with his participation, even if it's just a very tiny amount, everybody is a shareholder of this organization and when then um, this project is successful and the government see wow we get really valuable data there uh, we will maybe sponsor this project or um, maybe some research institutes pay money for this then this money can be distributed to all the shareholders so I think that might be one interesting applications but I think there are much more <laughs> like um, the way how how any organization <coughs> Uh, is is working <coughs> we are we are dependent on informal um, informal systems to exchange favors. <coughs> For instance, in FabLab, I don't know much about FabLab, how it works here, but I can imagine the resources, also the access to machines, it's a, it's a very valuable resource because everybody wants to use these great machines and uh, they are limited. So <coughs> when people are doing a lot of favors for FabLab, they are helping in many areas or so, they get then the favors, yeah, they can use it maybe for free and so. And that's very usual in every, in every uh, <coughs> organization not all parts are completely formalized you have always this informal part <coughs> and that's <coughs> perfectly fine it just has two problems one is it might be a little bit intransparent and it creates yeah some people complain about and jealous and whatever and that's also probably you have this everywhere uh, and the other problem is that you cannot move this uh, value <coughs> when somebody is doing a lot of work for FabLab altruistic and yeah he's uh, everybody knows him here in Barcelona and he can use the machines because everybody knows he's really has contributed so much to the community <coughs> he cannot uh, use this social value this reputation value when he moves to another fab lab in New York or wherever because yeah nobody knows him there and then he has to work again to get his reputation there so with tokens who are representing any kind of value whatever this is in your context you uh, extend this small group uh, of uh, people who know each other personally who are friends who are yeah uh, know each other <coughs> Uh, you can extend this group basically uh, globally and you can make it exchangeable <coughs> even with other communities when there are maybe the Cooperativa Catalana and they also do great stuff but have completely different tokens and uh, FabLab needs something for them or they need something from FabLab they can exchange their tokens and it becomes a, a multi-currency system where money is much more like the money what we know now it's not uh, this money where you can only use for buying stuff it can be, can be anything what represents value for you. And when uh, people have this opportunity that they don't need to earn their euro or the dollar with their jobs where they are selling their time like prostitution at the end when they are doing a job what they don't like. When they have possibilities that they can do what they want and create social value and uh, value for the society and get tokens which are interchangeable to other tokens and then maybe can buy a pizza in some restaurant with some kind of tokens, then we have a very alternative, very different and interesting monetary system which is much wider as this system what we have at the moment. <coughs> yeah. Uh, to make it a little bit more concrete, I want to explain how this uh, decentralized autonomous organization is planned to be implemented in BitSquare. As at the moment, I have not implemented it because I didn't have time, but it's planned for the next months, hopefully. In BitSquare, <coughs> Uh, yeah, the main motivation behind this, uh, as I developed this project um, with my own savings, with my own time, and a little bit of uh, community donations, <coughs> and that worked so far. Not very well, but it worked so far, but it does not scale. When now the project gets a lot of success and gets globally used, uh, it, it does not scale. I don't find <coughs> enough other developers who are so crazy like me and work all the time for free without earning money or with, yeah, it does not scale well. And <coughs> the other main reason is that uh, yeah, BitSquare tries to be decentralized in all 
and censorship resistant in all aspects. And if I would have a company or run it like a startup, that would be the single point of failure and I try to avoid this uh, at all costs in every layer. So how does it work? In, Bit, in BitSquare, I have the, the, fortune, uh, the fortunate uh, circumstances that money or Bitcoin is already present. Because in an exchange, yeah, you have money in your wallet, so that's uh, not a problem. And the people who are exchanging Bitcoin to other currencies, they are used that they, are, uh, they have to pay a fee. And this business model to pay a fee for a service is also very straight and very clear and honest business model. I prefer it much more <coughs> like business models where you get the service for free and then they take your privacy and sell, make business with your private data or where they give you free access long time and then when you are dependent on, their, on them because you have all your data and all your life already there, then you are uh, locked in and you cannot escape anymore. And I think taking fees is uh, probably much better like that. So we have already a revenue source for this DAO, and that's the trading fees. Besides that, uh, the trading fees are also needed for security reasons in BitSquare, because when there would not be fees for creating an offer, for instance, then you could create 10,000s of offers and could spam the whole system and create damage for everybody, because the infrastructure, there are no servers. The infrastructure is the peer-to-peer -peer network. So when you are uh, <coughs> creating too much load for the peer-to-peer -peer net uh, network, it's the load for everybody. So it's a common resource, a shared resource, and I think it's, uh, yeah, money is probably the best way how to regulate the usage, usage of this common resource. Yeah, the, so we have the money already. What happens with this money? <coughs> the money does not go to the DRO incorporation or whatever. It goes directly to the shareholders. And that's also a great feature in, Bit, uh, in Bitcoin. So you can do this. You can make this payment directly from yeah, when the, uh, the trader <coughs> has to pay his trading fee. He can select one of the shareholders and then he uh, the shareholder re receive directly this, um, this fee payment. So have a stream of micro payments because these payments are quite small so the trading fees will be maybe one euro or whatever very quite small amounts and the way how it they, they are paid yeah they are paid all, all over time so with every trade uh, there is a, such a small transaction and BitSquare has the other, <coughs> the other fortunate uh, situation that we have this peer-to-peer -peer system and we can implement quite a lot of this DAO directly in our peer-to-peer -peer system. So we don't need a platform like Ethereum <coughs> or others where we need uh, their infrastructure to execute the code. So the, the rules, how this payout works, how it is defined, which, arbitra uh, which uh, shareholder receives the fees and <coughs> other rules, <coughs> All that can be uh, implemented directly in the client software. So each user has the code running which is executing this DAO. And uh, Bitcoin blockchain is actually only used for uh, to avoid double spends. Only used like a time stamping server when you make a transaction or when somebody is selling the share because the shares, yeah, the shares are tokens on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. So they are Bitcoins, color coins there. And uh, when you are a shareholder, you can also sell it over Bitcoin or yeah, trade it over Bitcoin and you can transfer your share to somebody else. And to avoid uh, <coughs> the risk or the, yeah, the, the fraud risk <coughs> that uh, a seller of the share is selling at the same time to two people his share, we need the Bit, uh, Bitcoin network, <coughs> the uh, distributed database where everything is uh, defined <coughs> and where you cannot uh, make a transaction two times uh, to have the security. But the rest of the DAO is basically will be implemented in BitSquare. What else? Yeah, the shares comes also with voting rights. <coughs> so all important um, decisions, like uh, the height of the trading fees, for instance, <coughs> will be determined by the shareholders. Of course, the shareholders have incentive to make it fair because they want a lot of users. So it's they are yeah, they are running the company at the end. So when they are deciding, yeah, we take hundred euro fees, nobody will use it anymore. So they will kill their own their own stake. Does not 
yeah, it doesn't make sense. And an important part is, <coughs> uh, yeah, every, uh, the way how these shares are issued <coughs> is that every month for the work which is needed for the next month, uh, the top stakeholders, a group of the, of the shareholders who have the highest percentage, uh, they define how much, uh, or no, they, they make the payout to the contributors and how much it will, or the maximum amount, what uh, the, the DAO can issue per month will be also defined by voting, so every shareholder can say okay we need maybe this month an amount of so uh, x shares and that can change every every month basically so the risk that uh, this uh, board are doing completely stupid stuff is quite low because everybody can vote on it and when they make wrong decision it's always limited to one month also when they would make wrong decisions the users can when they're updating the software they're also voting in a way because when there is a change what they would not support and they don't update then the change is not implemented because the user is not running this uh, version. So it's quite a distributed um, a distributed structure of power and a little bit similar to Bitcoin as well. In Bitcoin you have also many different entities like the miners, the developers, the users, the merchants and sometimes it seems <coughs> that it's very problematic in Bitcoin with the power concentration on the miners or developers or whatever. <coughs> but when you look closer, it's quite a balance because the miners, they cannot do too much. When they would make a 51% attack and collude all together and steal money or whatever, yeah, nobody will use it anymore. They get forked and they are out and they are killing their investment. The developers as well, when they would develop something stupid, nobody will upgrade to this software and yeah, it's so it's a quite interesting balance of different different entities who have different power and who are all in the same boat at the end that I think it works quite good and I think that's the challenge of a DAO that you construct it in a way that all these elements are playing good together and then the instant that the incentives align because at the end it's never 100 percent decentralized because <coughs> yeah you, you always have the human involvement and that's not decentralized I cannot decentralize myself but um, when you create the right incentives then you avoid any kind of abuse and open source is another factor which is very important here because when this board would make completely stupid decisions or whatever <coughs> then anybody can fork it and yeah the competitor will take over the, pro, uh, the project. So they, the board and the people who are, yeah, who are uh, more in power in the, in the project, they have a high responsibility and have a high interest, of course, because they are the main stakeholders, to uh, manage the project uh, in a good way. And yeah, the payout of uh, these shares to contributors, if a developer <coughs> wants to contribute, he will receive, instead of euro, he will receive a certain amount of shares that will be equivalent to what he would like to get in euro but convert it to the price with the price of the share and this that's maybe the most traditional part <coughs> because that's basically like in any company when you have a good developer you will pay him good because otherwise he will uh, look for another job when <coughs> yeah when somebody wants a lot of money for a, a part uh, for a for a job for a task which was not really important and you don't think that was not so high okay you argue with him or negotiate and if he does not accept okay then you will lo lose him but maybe it's not a big problem because the uh, the contract was not so valuable. So the board who is doing this uh, judgment um, about the value what the contributor receive is basically like in any company, the guy with, who, with whom you are negotiating your salary and he tried to make the best for the company. He don't want to lose the good guys and when somebody wants too much money, okay, he let him go. And one second. <coughs> a big challenge for such a project is, of course, how to organize people in such a system where you don't have a CAO, where you don't have a hierarchical structure. And luckily, there are quite uh, interesting and successful examples for this. The Swedish Pirate Party. <coughs> Also, Rick Falkwing is the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party, and he has written a book, Swarmwise, the tactical manual to, change, uh, to changing the world. 
is a, a very valuable inspiration for this. He described here in this book uh, how yeah, about his strategy, what he has used to build up this swarm-like organization of the power parties. There was nearly no hierarchy. There was <coughs> nearly no organization in a classical sense. <coughs> he just set up the infrastructure to uh, that the people can self-organize, like a forum. You just set up a forum and, and invite the people, and they should manage to take their task to find out what what's need what's need to be done, and they find uh, define their groups working together, and it's fluently, it's all voluntarily, <coughs> it's transparent, and as, and I think it uh, it unleashes a lot of potential of people because when you are forced because you work for a job and you get the money and then you have to do what your boss tell you, <coughs> yeah, you're working not so creative and so efficient like when you work on your own project where you are completely free and where you do what you really want to do. And I think that's for the whole society a huge um, potential which is currently unfortunately not used at all. I mean 90% of the people are doing jobs where they are not, uh, not using all their potential what they have. And I think such a system where you just uh, provide the space and leave it to the people that they self-organize, that they find their way where they can be useful in the in the overall system uh, is a very is not only for such a project very important and powerful, but for the whole society. <coughs> and that brings me to this <coughs> point that. <coughs> Uh, for me, this project and this concept of DAO and the Swarmwise, for me that has <coughs> much more uh, potential and importance like it's in this context of Bitcoin or a Bitcoin exchange. Because I think <coughs> uh, our society is really challenged with really hard uh, problems like the climate change and archaeological problems and much more. And these problems <coughs> uh, don't get solved uh, because uh, we it, our current uh, system, our capitalist system is not, um, does not align with this. You don't get money, you don't get incentives, uh, there are no incentives and you don't get a reward when you're doing work which is valuable for the community, for the society, but you get a lot of money when you do things which are very, very har harmful for the society. I've also worked in my last two companies in such stuff, so it was no good, no good stuff for the society, but it was super easy to earn good money. But when you you want to do something really good when you want to uh, work for Amnesty International, yeah, they will not pay you anything because they don't have the money to pay the people. But when you work for a bit, big bank or the blockchain now, then you get a whole shit of money. And yeah, so I think uh, we need to, to solve this really really I think that's ex existential problems what we are running in I mean the climate change when we are not uh, getting dissolved it uh, it's a it's a huge uh, huge risk and and uh, damage for the whole planet and I think we need to find ways how we are changing this incentive systems that people who are <coughs> who want to contribute for something good that they have a chance to make the living with this because many people <coughs> they are not happy with their work they would like to do something good. I also, in my own, old jobs, I would like to have worked for open source projects, but I would not have any, earned any money and I needed the money to survive. It's, uh, and when you have a family, you are much more limited. So many people just cannot escape. And there are, at the end, not too many people I know who are really so evil and really want to do all this shit. The huge majority, 90%, I think, they are aware that their, their work, what they are doing in these jobs is not really something good for the society. But yeah, they are locked in in these systems, and there are no alternatives. And I think to create uh, infrastructure for alternatives, to create such DAOs where maybe uh, many different DAOs and small, it will not change the world in one day, of course. But I think it's a development which can, in the next 10, 20 years, maybe bring a huge difference, maybe in the same, in the same extent like the internet itself. And with such a system of uh, interchangeable value representation models, like I said before, where you have your tokens in different communities and they become valuable and they're not like our normal uh, money, not so narrow. Uh, I think with such models we have an escape to get uh, new forms where people who want to do something for the future uh, can become active and become productive and can, uh, can use their creativity and their potential. 
so I hope you got motivated a little bit and uh, if you want to join uh, the BitSquare project in any any uh, way if you're a developer or yeah, com uh, want to be active in a community or whatever uh, go to our webpage bitsquare.io you can find all information there you find the download link for the software the source code the white paper <coughs> videos our communication channels our main channel is now the forum so when you have any questions just pass by there are many people already there and uh, answering your questions and yeah I think I yeah and I also try to bring this idea and this message to a broader audience so I'm making this tour uh, through 15 cities in the next months and for me this uh, communities like such a meetup or a fab lab or so is very important because I think here are the kind of these early adopters of the people who are trying to yeah there are many people of you I think are active in something and it's more interesting like a conference where people are just there for looking up for the next business opportunity or whatever so I'm happy to be here and uh, that's it um, if you have any questions What kind of way are you going to use for promote your product in worldwide? For, for promotion? Yeah, for promotion of the product. Uh, I also I try to make a decentralized promotion or marketing. Uh, that sounds a little bit strange maybe, but that actually it works. I don't have any funds, I don't have money to pay for, for professional marketing, I don't like this style also. Uh, so I started, yeah, I, I, I contacted people who I know already from uh, magazines and uh, for interviews. So I've got four or five interviews the last week. I, I tried to make this tour through the Bitcoin uh, communities uh, spaces to talk to the people. I'm personally active on the social network, try to answer uh, the questions what are there. <coughs> and that's one important aspect in this swarm wise. He said, uh, when you don't have money, you have to give uh, the people uh, attribution you have to appreciate when somebody is uh, putting energy and time that he is uh, formulating a question or whatever when you let wait him a week before you answer him yeah that's frustrating but when you're very quick with answering and when you really take uh, every contribution very serious then you motivate the people that it's growing and I think it works already pretty good also so basically since a, uh, since a week just because before I was very very busy with development and didn't spend much time then I had one interview and with this interview it was uh, quite exploding until yet hopefully it goes on like this okay thank you and one another question that I have I was in another event yesterday and uh, some of the guys was raising the funds for some kind of project like this so doesn't you afraid that you can um, the people that won't see you because we appear in other companies with the big money, with the big investments, who is taking a fees, a big percent of fees for the exchanges. So some, you know, you know how it works in our society is that you need big money for promotion, for get no to the people. So doesn't your phrase that you can be like nobody in this uh, market? Yeah, I know this problem and I think it's unfortunate that it still works so well, but I've seen already, uh, I think, and that's also the message in this swarm wise, and probably it does not work with any project. When you make a block explorer, that's not a project where you can attract people that they become really motivated. But I think when you do something which is, uh, yeah, which really tries to move something to change the world in a positive way and people feel that this is real and this is authentic and makes sense, then I think the message arrives and until yet I had the impression that it uh, yeah it works by itself and uh, maybe it's even more efficient like like all this marketing with money and that was the case with the pirate parties when they started they have zero budget no money at all 
they started from zero and they got, I don't know, 20% or so immediately. And the other parties were really shocked and they, they analyzed and tried to explain what, uh, yeah, wh how, how it could work, a new party with no money and such a success. It was just because they had a message which was real, which was not uh, created by marketing professionals, which was really what people think and feel and they had the possibility and the community to transport this. You can, I don't know, maybe for the other way. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was a great presentation. You um, explained well um, not only the product but also your philosophy behind it. And uh, yeah, cool. Um, the question is about um, the transaction fees. Um, it's quite unusual that um, a transaction fee is applied on an offer and not on a completed um, trade. And um, I, I'm not sure. I've not thought it through. But um, it's is, is that compatible? to other exchanges where um, a fee is paid only once a transaction is completed? Um, <coughs> also, <coughs> there's one technical and conceptual reason for this, because without an offer fee, or the, when you create an offer for free, <coughs> you have the spam problem and other problems as well, like market manipulation. You can create a lot of offers and fill it up, and they're all invalid at the end. <coughs> so that's one of the first main reasons. And the other is that the offerer who is creating the offer will not pay any more when the offer is taken. So the, the, when the offer is taken, only the one who is taking the offer will pay. And the offer fee is also smaller, is the half actually, uh, like the taker fee. At the moment they are also super low, they are uh, yeah, a little bit more like the mining fees, the Bitcoin mining fees. So they are, <coughs> yeah, they are naturally will. So they are, and later of course we will adopt it to whatever the DAO decides which should be the fee. It will be more, in, more or less in the range of competitors probably but probably lower <coughs> and yeah, I think uh, I, I've heard already this complaint that people have a little bit problems. It has a little bit uh, use. Of, um, it's a missing feature at the moment that you cannot change the offer. So when when you make an offer, you cannot change the price later. <coughs> that will be also implemented later. And but you can already uh, make a dynamic price, so you can set your price one percent under the market price. So it goes always with the market, and you don't need to adapt and change your offer. But yeah. It's a, I mean, this exchange has another concept like centralized exchanges and has also its limitations. You cannot make this day trading style trading where you can trade every few seconds with, uh, yeah, make a lot of trades very fast because of this minimum one blockchain confirmation that's average 10 minutes, as a trade takes minimum 10 minutes in average. And also when you make a fiat transfer with the banks, yeah, the banks are unfortunately very slow. When you use other payment methods like this okay pay or altcoins then it can be also immediate but uh, it's also not compatible to to a, yeah, to a centralized exchange where you can make a kind of high frequency trading it's another model it's more like this local Bitcoin for the Bitcoin people here they are probably familiar with this it's a yeah it's a different sort of exchange like the classical centralized exchanges there are maybe in future plans and possibilities to make it all more automatic and get more in this direction, but it's complex and uh, future plans. Okay, I understand. Makes sense. Um, changing the um, offer would be then, from my point of view, a very important priority for um, next development steps because um, otherwise you just lose the offer if um, the market changes. <coughs> Yeah, I have another question um, uh, regarding. So, uh, uh, the project is a Bitcoin trade only, or will the um, project um, or BitSquare um, in future also support other um, tokens, other digital currencies? Yeah, the main currency is always Bitcoin. So you can <coughs> exchange Bitcoin to a uh, national currency, basically any in the world, <coughs> because all you need is a payment method, and we uh, we support national bank transfer. And I think in nearly every country of the world. 
they have bank transfers <coughs> so they can use it. And uh, on the altcoin side, we support at the moment 30 altcoins or whatever, and we're very open. We don't want to be gatekeepers for this resource, so we add any altcoins who are fu fulfilling a minimum requirement and who are not completely scam coins or fascist coin. I got today, uh, 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 yeah, somebody wanted to add a, tr a Donald Trump coin, and I will not add Donald Trump coin, and I also will not add a Mussolini coin and an Adolf Hitler coin. So here are my limits. Sorry, I'm the, the dictator. I'm here is my my limits of my tolerance, but all other coins are welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, one one question I have, or more, more a question: Do you have the vision that you could uh, exchange, always pivoting um, around Bitcoin, but uh, exchange other things than crypto or or fiat? For example, shares or stakes or, or yeah. time <coughs> time bench. Uh, the BitSquare uh, DAO tokens are shares at the end, so they will be traded over BitSquare. At, at the end, they are the same like uh, like Alcoin. <coughs> they are tokens, and I think at the moment there's still no assets from uh, like Next or Counterparty. They have a lot of assets like shares at the end, and I think I don't know so much about it because I never used it. But they are basically like an Alcoin, as far as I know. Do you have an address and make a transfer and have your explorer to check it? So we are. Yeah, we don't have any limits there. There are, yeah, there are many possible uh, extensions, and it can be a cr yeah, plans for maybe a micro credit market, a peer to peer micro credit market where people can lend money to each other. <coughs> there are plans for coin join, which helps for uh, getting anonymity back. There are plans for maybe kind of CD, uh, CFD, so contract for different trading, <coughs> where you can get then to this more sort of uh, high frequency trading or whatever because then you don't need to really make the fear transfer you yeah you abstract it in a, in a financial product and make the trade there but that's all future plans and for me I'm I'm actually not so much interested in all these financial possibilities I I'm much more interested in this DIO stuff and the DIO I think when it really works <coughs> it will produce a lot of sub projects because the first thing when there are really many people you need a, a working communication platform and as we know all the existing communication platform like reddit or the forums or whatever they work they don't work well because they have the trolls and the people who are loud and have nothing to say they occupy they create a lot of noise and you don't get the signal out anymore and it's a lot of work for filtering the information and I think <coughs> in such a DAO model where uh, we are where everybody's a shareholder you have already money and tokens in and you can use this <coughs> as uh, for for the communication as well so when somebody is uh, want to say something he has to pay a very tiny amount and when somebody else thinks that was a great comment and upvoted you receive money so people who are creating good content from the yeah, from the your posting or for from your ideas what you're promoting you can earn money when somebody else is just posting bullshit he has to pay and I think that uh, might be a solution which works in this context because it's already money and it's already tokens there and which helps to create more quality and creates better results. That's one of these projects where I'm more interested, like expanding it to financial, more complex financial systems. But when it really works that there are more developers joining and more people, it's open that other people are working on some uh, sub-projects and uh, will get in. Um, first of all, thanks for the for, for the presentation and congratulations for the project because I, I find very inspiring to see uh, somebody doing a project this size out of passion uh, and not really for economical uh, gain, which is uh, very unique uh, nowadays, I think. Or so, um, congratulations. And my question is related to. Uh, Something you mentioned about uh, just using the blockchain to, to, to for these transactions on bitcoins and nothing else. And um, my question is more uh, about the DAO and how to handle all, all this distributed information. Uh, what would be the benefits of doing it off the blockchain? 
like like you are doing and uh, and the inconveniences uh, and if you do it uh, on the blockchain, uh, like using something like Ethereum or smart contracts? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think when this project would have been developed in Ethereum, I would have probably used maybe the Ethereum uh, uh, infrastructure, but it has uh, a few disadvantages. I mean, to use a blockchain or Ethereum for code execution and so on is expensive and it's slow because the blockchains, the main benefit is that you get this tamper-proof timestamping database where every information exists only one and it's it's ordered correctly. And, sto and executing logic and so on <coughs> is not uh, the, main, the main target of that. And uh, many people will use it because they don't have a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. And, but when you have already a peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure, and I use actually already in the application a similar use kit, what I would need for the DAO tokens I use already. It's basically that you have just a check. The check is signed by the by the board. Everybody in the application has the public key to verify that the, the signature is correct and everything. And the only thing where I need the blockchain is uh, to avoid the double spend, to make this timestamping when you're transferring one check to another person that you cannot spend it two times. And all the rest I can, I can do on my network and actually, it's already uh, used for yeah for some uh, parts uh, for the arbitrator, for instance. When <coughs> at the moment uh, this decentralized arbitration system is not in place yet, that needs a few months more development. <coughs> and at the moment, uh, I'm the only arbitrator, and then maybe a few other people who I know personally, where there is no risk of scam or uh, collusion, so we don't have the need for this more complex system. <coughs> and the, when you uh, be, at the moment when I'm uh, uh, publishing an arbitrate in the system, I sign it with my private key, <coughs> which only I have, and everybody in the application verify uh, this data with the public key, which, which is in the software, and it's basically a similar concept. And in with the tokens, you just sign a, a check where it is amount and a Bitcoin address and yeah, and a few more information. But it's simply not needed, and I don't want to introduce another technology or a company who provides services because it just in introduced dependencies and it's not needed. Probably it's faster for me when I develop it my own, like I have to adapt to other APIs and whatever. Thank you. Um, I have a question more. Uh, to the consumer side, more like a little bit the practical operation of the the system you proposed, because at the end of the day, the two sides are gonna go have to go to the physical to the real banks, right? Whatever they have their accounts to do the transfer. Uh, I, I see right now as a as an issue when they are one of the sides or both of them are coming from countries that uh, have normally have. Uh, financial regulations or financial impositions that a simple white transfer is not that simple. It's controlled by the central bank or has high fees. Somehow we'll still connect, we'll bring them to other solutions like uh, PayPal or things like that, which can actually help. But uh, how can we actually try to overcome this? Otherwise, uh, maybe it would be easier for them to go to the normal Bitcoin wallets that are spread all over. Yeah. Um, the banks uh, are, of course, the main problem in the whole system. <coughs> Unfortunately, that's this legacy 70, 70s uh, system, <coughs> which does not, uh, which don't offer APIs where you can automate process and you don't get verifications when you did a transfer or whatever. So that's the, <coughs> yeah, that's this difficult problem where we need this human work to make it work in such a project. I would love to get uh, other solutions. <coughs> I mean, in OKP and Perfect Money, they offer some such APIs so you can you can basically program your own bank account in the application with the APIs so you can make a lot automated but <coughs> from the regulatory side with the banks um, 
I, I don't know how it is in other countries, <clears throat> but at least in Europe, I think you don't have a problem when you make a transfer from one person to the other over the banking system. You don't see, uh, the banks does not see anything from a Bitcoin trade. They just get an, a reference number, which is the trade ID, but it's a number like any other when you make a purchase at Amazon or whatever, you also get always uh, ID. <clears throat> and the bank just see, okay, there's a transfer from 400 euro from this person to another person. It's nothing, they don't know anything about uh, the, the project and about uh, Bitcoin. <coughs> um, it has, on the, on the other side, a, a benefit for BitSquare, for BitSquare from the regulatory side with all these uh, stupid lo uh, yeah, regulatory uh, issues like an anti-money laundering and so, <coughs> that as long as you stay uh, with low amounts, like 400 euro, you usually <coughs> not triggering these rules. That's when you are transferring 5,000 euro or whatever, you need, you, uh, yeah, it's more difficult. And <coughs> on the other side, uh, the, when some Somebody is doing money laundering with 100,000 euro. <coughs> he has the same problem uh, if he use a normal exchange or a bit square because he gets the money at, the, at his bank account and the bank account or the bank will uh, raise the red flags. So we are basically outside of all these problems. The bank are are in yeah in charge of this uh, taking care of the, of these rules from uh, uh, anti money laundering and so on. If there would be solutions where you can transfer fiat money without banks, that would be fantastic. I would love to <coughs> find such a solution. The only what I know is uh, cash by mail, but that is either ver as it is a, it is either very slow and insecure, or very slow and expensive, and turns the bank office to a bank because when you are registering, when it's a registered transfer of money, then the bank office is like the bank at uh, the, the post office is like the bank so you don't gain anything it's just uh, even slower like the banks which is probably hard but maybe they make it even slower and more expensive so that does not that's not an option as well so I think uh, we are somehow locked in to this to this uh, centuries old infrastructure what they have built up and hopefully more and more people move completely out and are just interacting in Bitcoin and in, in other cryptocurrencies and someday we just don't need the fiat money anymore more just for the for the flea market you can buy then the dollar notes as, uh, yeah that, that was used in the early in the early century <laughs> hopefully we get there soon <laughs> You want to ask something else like next? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, is it possible to exchange not uh, money for Bitcoin, but uh, work for Bitcoin with uh, BitSquare? I mean, uh, since somebody wants to hire you to develop program or something else. Yeah, the DIO is such a model when somebody wants to work, he can earn these tokens, which are basically money also. <coughs> You can sell the tokens like an uh, altcoin or like another share or whatever. Uh, in BitSquare directly is not such a uh, possibility. I mean, another future project might be a marketplace like Open Bazaar, but that's also far in the future. And in a marketplace, of course, you can offer whatever goods or services or work for Bitcoin, but that's uh, not planned in the next year at least. Thank you. This guy has just a Hi. I have several questions on DO and shares and also approval of the transaction. So basically, how can we obtain shares? And if fees are transferred directly to shareholders, um, does the DAO hold any funds like to pay for the developers or to pay for any service by itself? If the DAO, uh, if, the, if the fees are transferred directly to the shareholders, does it mean that the DAO does not hold any funds to pay for the developers, for example? Yeah, so, uh, the fees goes directly to the existing shareholders and uh, when new developers are working, uh, every month there is a new issuance of shares. So every, it's like in a startup you have a, uh, at the beginning, they are selling usually 20% of their shares to, uh, to the investors and then after two years there's the next round and so on. So they make this issuance every few years and then get a lot of money to fund the next uh, years and the, the developers and the work 
network and we want to make it uh, in a very small sc uh, scale with little money and with short time because it's less risk and more flexible so the plan is to issue every month the amount what's needed for the next month because we can estimate okay we have now 40 developers we need this amount of money in shares and then uh, the stakeholders uh, need to assign or need to um, to confirm to this amount they can vote okay we don't want to spend so much or maybe we they want to spend more and to get more developers to speed up more but yeah does this answer your question How is it certified that the um, person approving the transaction, whether it's uh, the seller or the buyer side, is really himself and not a hacker if you're not using some kind of blockchain technology? So how do I log in as a seller and say, okay, it's me and I approve this transaction because I received the money? Um. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network works over Tor, and in Tor or Tor Hidden Services, you have this Onion address, <coughs> and that's a super great concept because uh, it's much more safe, like a normal HTTPS uh, web page, because there you need these central um, certification authorities, which are uh, central point of failures. <coughs> you need to trust them that they are not lying and that they not got hacked and that happened. And in Tor, it's more like a Bitcoin address. <coughs> When somebody is able to reach you, he Yeah, he need to have uh, his private key and every message what the traders are exchanging are signed and encrypted. So in BitSquare you have either completely private data which is accessible to everybody like the Bitcoin blockchain basically. So like the offers in this case. So everybody can can yeah, filter the offer and do whatever they want with this data. <coughs> also there's no security assumption that BitSquare is controlling some data or whatever. So either it's completely public or it's completely completely private between the traders and then it's encrypted on our side and signed and also when over Tor is also everything encrypted so it's yeah I think it's um, as long as we don't have stupid implementation bugs I think the cons from the concept it's very secure are you controlling uh that uh, there are no forks uh, with malicious uh, functionality on the net network that can steal arbitrating key or uh, to redirect uh, uh, address uh, to receive the uh, fee of exchange. Um, as the fee payment will be verified by the other users. <coughs> When you make a trade and you have cheated somehow, as the one thing is that you don't earn much money because for you it's very little money. <coughs> so the incentives to, uh, when you're a developer, you could maybe do it yourself, uh, but the incentives are low. I mean, when you're a developer who is able to change this code, then you can earn much easier money probably than cheating with that. <coughs> and when you would use a fork which has removed the fee, you would risk that this fork, uh, it's a trust issue. When you're installing, especially a peer-to-peer -peer application, you need to trust this person because you have all ports open. It's a security risk. I would not install a peer-to-peer -peer application from somebody who's doing something unethical, like avoiding the fees from the from the real people, because he probably installed a backdoor and then you have a big problem and he's, stalling all your bit, uh, he's stealing all your Bitcoin and damaging your computer. And I would not have much... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, what uh, was at uh, the beginning the question? Ar uh, arbitrating key. Uh, arbitrating how, the key. How it generated and uh, how you are controlling that? Uh, yeah, no the, one. Uh, the, it's just a keeper, a public and private keeper. <coughs> and at the moment, as I'm the arbitrator, I have the private key, and I'm signing this statement, and then everybody with the public can verify it. <coughs> and yeah, the fee payment is also verified by the other traders. So when you are cheating, and the, uh, somebody make a trade with you, he will reject it, and yeah, you cannot sell your Bitcoin or whatever, because every other trader will reject it. It would only work when a majority of the people will upgrade to this uh, fork, to this unethical fork. <coughs> But then at some point, okay, I will say, okay, when the whole society is so unethical, then why should I work on this? And then uh, probably nobody, when they don't earn money, nobody will develop it and improve it and pick, uh, make the bug fixes. So yeah, then society deserves like it is. 
So for the moment, you are the only one who have uh, arbitrating key. At the moment, I'm the only arbitrator because there are mostly okay. software bugs and usability issues, and it's much easier for me to handle it myself. And luckily, there was not much cases the last two weeks, at least, was nearly nothing. And when it becomes more, then I have a group of friends who will become the next. Because to make this fully decentralized arbitration system, mm -hmm. the complex <coughs> and the part which costs a lot of effort is uh, these arbitrators. Anybody can become an arbitrator then, and to make it secure that. This this arbitrator is not uh, <coughs> colluding with one trader and scamming the other trader. We need, uh, he need to p uh, pay a very high security deposit to a multisig address, and this multisig will be a three or five multisig, where the key holders are these arbitrators with the highest reputation, which has also uh, most money in this security deposit, because the security deposit will grow over time with every money what the arbitrator is earning. A part of this money goes to the security uh, uh, to this deposit again, so the longer he works, the more money he has to lose, the higher gets his reputation. And when he is makes a scam, and the other trader uh, asks then the Bitcoin team what was going on there, and we investigate the case of this highest arbitrators, which are basically probably those who start at the beginning, which are no personally, where we can uh, trust that th those are not scammers, they will investigate the case again, and when they find out this arbitrator was scamming, then he will lose all his security deposit, which will be something like 5 or 10 Bitcoin. And to earn half a Bitcoin and then lose 5 Bitcoin, that's not a good deal. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the great illustration of the centralized uh, exchanges.